Uh, good morning and welcome. Our first hymn, 701. Mine eyes have seen the glory of the coming of the Lord. His truth is marching on. Let's stand and sing together. 701. Psalm 33 is a, a wonderful psalm to be thinking about on Independence Day. It tells us that blessed is the nation whose God is the Lord. Amen. Of course, a reference to Israel in that case, but certainly it's true of any nation. Any nation that looks to the God of the Bible as the only God uh, will be blessed by that God and strengthened by that God as we follow his word and what he has revealed to us. So let's pray and ask the Lord to bless our nation. Mm -hmm. Father, we are so thankful for your word. We, we know that it is right and that all of your work that you have done, you have done in truth. You love righteousness and justice. We pray that our nation would reflect those characteristics. The earth is filled with your goodness. We pray that our nation would be thankful for what you've provided. Help us to realize that you are the creator and we, the creation. And so we fear you in the sense that we know that you're near, have to give an accounting of our lives, the stewardship that you've granted to us, not just as individuals, but as a nation too. And so we pray that our nation would again stand in awe of you, and that all the inhabitants of the earth would do the same. Bring the counsel of the nations to nothing, plans of the people to no effect because blessed is that nation whose God is the Lord and so look from heaven father and may we find our strength in you our hope may it be firmly in your daily mercy we wait for you you are our help and shield there's coming a day when the kingdoms of this world will be the kingdoms of our Lord and Christ, we ask that our heart would rejoice in this, that we would trust in your holy name until that day. Let your mercy, O Lord, be upon the United States of America, just as we hope in you. We pray for Jesus' sake. Amen. You may be seated. How thankful I am to live in the United States of America. I think it's 245 years today, right? Uh, as far as uh, our nation's birthday is concerned, I can remember in 1976, the bicentennial. Uh, I was living in Michigan at the time, and 
they painted all of the fire hydrants red, white, and blue, and they came out with a special quarter that year. And uh, it was just a great blessing to, to be alive. I can remember the fireworks being so close that the ash and the cinders were falling on our cars. And just in the Midwest, the family orientation, a lot of that is disappearing today, I understand that. But I'm still reminded of our academy motto. Our academy motto here at Heritage is sacrifice, service, and strength. And as we think about that, that motto, Personally, what I've tried to do is emulate those characteristics in my life. I try to sacrifice for people, serve people, and I try to garner my strength from the Lord by trusting in Him. Some trust in chariots, some in horses, but we remember the name of the Lord our God. And so, if our nation is going to continue, I think the citizenry must do the same. They have to take up that mantle of sacrifice, service, and strength again. And uh, right now, uh, it's not about living for other people, I think, in our nation. It's about living for self. And that really is the crux of our problem. Uh, it's not enough for us as Christians to look back at the past and say, you know, we can remember fondly what the United States was, although there was problems in the past too. And so we, we have to just key in on the future. Where is the sacrifice, service, and strength in the coming generation? How are we emulating that as the current generation? Those are the things that we need uh, to be concentrating on. Um, it's not enough for us to simply be free, right? I, I used to love it when uh, President Bush would say, freedom is on the march. I agree with that concept, not necessarily how we carry it out all the time, but I agree that many countries look to our country and they are thankful for the freedoms that we have. My, my wife, played an interview uh, this week where many of uh, the, the people that denigrate this nation uh, were people that grew up here and had everything that this nation had to offer. And uh, many of the people that were grateful for this country in the interviews on the street were people who uh, had come to this country because they had been repressed and they understand what they have here. And uh, it just floors me how we have this entitlement mindset as natives of this land. Uh, tyrants, repressive regimes, they're still abounding in our world today. They, they are repressing their populace and abusing their people. And that's why the United States of America should be uh, a nation of great hope for people all over the world. We should be a nation where people should feel like we can go there. They will, they will take us in. We, we will have the freedom to worship as we choose. We will have the freedom to make our own way and not be repressed. That's the kind of nation that we need to be again. And so what we do with the freedom that we have, that's our stewardship as a nation. And I believe that we will be accountable for that stewardship. And so that's why I pray that God would be merciful to our nation and gracious to us once again. Uh, because we need revival in the years ahead so that we will be a land that's willing to sacrifice and serve uh, the people around us because we're garnering our strength from the God of the Bible. That's what it all comes down to. Uh, by way of uh, coming events uh, this summer, a lot of people are traveling. We need to keep uh, folks in prayer, but the floor project, as you know, is ongoing. When I took apart the front entryway, the floors, or the, the doors just came down. They're kind of pinned in there between the threshold and the, the top front, uh, the top header of the door. And so when I started to strip that rod away, they just kind of fell down. And uh, when the silk came out, I had to catch them and, and uh, set them to the side. They didn't break, I'm thankful for that, they're expensive. So the door company will be coming and they'll be working on that on Wednesday. So when you come back next Sunday, you should be able to come in the entryway and we should have the floor project finished, at least down at that end. Uh, we've got this entryway coming in this side that we're going to take the vinyl flooring in uh, a little bit there too, in order to keep the building a little bit cleaner uh, so that we can mop up these floors. The Logans are going on vacation, so pray for them as they head into Michigan again. Hopefully it won't be too humid and they'll, they'll
they'll be able to swim to their destination. I hear there's a lot of water in the state of Michigan right now. Um, we have a baby dedication for Sophie Fithian uh, coming up on July 18th, so that's two weeks from today. And I should mention uh, that the Fithians last Sunday will be on that day too. They're going to be moving to Arkansas. They have family that are there. And so that will be a tremendous uh, change for them. So that will be their last Sunday. So uh, make sure that you come and, and say goodbye to the Fithian family. We're looking forward to being a blessing to them on that special day. And then also we have a blood drive that is planned for August 13th, but that's next week, or next month rather, so a little bit down the road. Uh, but pray that that would be a good success and a good opportunity to reach out to people in our community. I think that will do it for announcements. We'll go ahead and continue with our song service. Six hundred and ninety-eight, my country, tis of thee, let freedom live. Six hundred and ninety-eight. to be praised in the city of our God, in his holy mountain. Beautiful in elevation, the joy of the whole earth is Mount Zion on the sides of the north, the city of the great king. God is in her palaces. He is known as her refuge. For behold, the kings assembled, they passed by together. They saw it, and so they marveled. They were troubled. They hastened away. Fear took hold of them there, and pain as of a woman in birth pains. As when you break the ships of Tarshish with an east wind. As we have heard, so we have seen, in the city of the Lord of hosts, in the city of our God, God will establish it forever. We have thought, O God, on your loving kindness in the midst of your temple. According to your name, O God, so is your praise to the ends of the earth. Your right hand is full of righteousness. Let Mount Zion rejoice. Let the daughters of Judah be glad because of your judgments. Walk about Zion and go all around her. Count her towers. Mark well her bulwarks. Consider her palaces, that you may tell it to the generation following. For this is God, our God forever and ever. He will be our God even to death. Amen. Psalm 48. Pastor? All right, let's pray for the offering together. Father, thank you for uh, 
uh, the promises that we have in your word. Thank you for the fact that you are this stable foundation, uh, someone we can look to for the strength that we need to live life in a way that is acceptable and pleasing in your sight. So as we give this morning, we pray that that too would be acceptable and pleasing. Help us, Lord, to give in, in a way that will bring you honor, not begrudgingly, but with hearts that are aflame with love. Love toward you and love toward the people around us. We pray it in Jesus' name. This morning is 699 beautiful four spacious skies. Let's stand and sing this together. <laughs>
All right, it is good to see you uh, this morning. We're continuing our series in 1 Corinthians titled Conduct in the Church, and we made it to chapter 13, and the title of this morning's message is True Love, and it comes from the heart of the chapter, verses 4 through 7, but we'll read verses 4 through 7 in context this morning. So let's look in our Bibles to 1 Corinthians 13 together, starting in verse 1. Though I speak with the tongues of men and of angels, but have not love, I have become sounding brass or a clanging cymbal. Though I have the gift of prophecy and understand all mysteries and all knowledge, and though I have all faith so that I can remove mountains, but have not love, I am nothing. Though I bestow all my goods to feed the poor, and though I give my body to be burned, but have not love, it profits me nothing. Love suffers long and is kind. Love does not envy. Love does not parade itself, is not puffed up, does not behave rudely, does not seek its own, is not provoked, thinks no evil, does not rejoice in iniquity, but rejoices in the truth, bears all things, believes all things, hopes all things, endures all things. Love never fails. But whether there are prophecies, they will fail. Whether there are tongues, they will cease. Whether there is knowledge, it will vanish away. For we know in part and we prophesy in part. But when that which is perfect has come, then that which is in part will be done away. When I was a child, I spoke as a child. I understood as a child. I thought as a child. But when I became a man, I put away childish things. For now we see in a mirror dimly, but then face to face. Now I know in part, but then I shall know just as I also am known. And now abide faith, hope, love, these three. But the greatest of these is love. 1 Corinthians chapter 13, verses 1 through 13. I don't always quote Chesterton. Um, He's kind of a, a Catholic mystic from the deep past. Uh, but there are a lot of things that he has written that are very, very good and picturesque. And so uh, I'm thinking about a passage, particularly this quotation comes from a passage of one of his books that deals with pessimism and optimism and the problem with both of those. And so he said, love is not blind. That is the last thing that it is. Love is bound. And the more it is bound, the less that it is blind. Now, what did he mean by this? Well, I think if we look at the context, he concluded the thought with this. He said, the moment we have a fixed heart, we have a free hand. In other words, that, that's the problem with the viewpoint that's optimistic or the problem with the viewpoint that's pessimistic. Half full, half empty, it really doesn't matter. Uh, what he is saying here is that whenever you seek to improve the world, you have to be connected with the people that are in the world. If you're not connected with those people, there's no improvement that can take place. And that's the problem with religious activity that, that is not connected with the people that are around us. Religious activity that's not connected with the people around us, and I would argue that the, the connection there should be compassion because that's what Jesus did. He looked out into the multitudes of people and he had compassion on them. If that compassion, that love is missing, then all we have is just a set of religious ideals that are put up on a shelf. People might admire them, but it's a form of religion without the power thereof. There is no love in that religious activity. And so that's how Paul begins uh, 1 Corinthians 13. And so if we borrow then Chesterton's thought here, love then is bound to the people of the world. It's not blind to them. And so that's the way the Lord Jesus was. He exemplified love that was connected to the people that are around him. And that's the way that we ought to be. It is a love that, absolute, that is absolutely necessary uh, for our world. And, and the only way that people are largely going to see that love is if it is emulated in the disciples of Christ and believers uh, around uh, our country. Now, 
we talked about the first major movement of this chapter, and that is the necessity of love, last week. And so we painted this vivid picture in verses 1 through 3 of the necessity of love. And people uh, are certainly performing religious activities, and some of these activities may be wonderful. Uh, some of them may be miraculous, right? Uh, Paul's saying you might speak with the tongues of men. You can, you can be able to understand many different languages or, or the tongue, uh, tongues of angels, whatever that looked like in that first century church. I, I, I mean, I have a hard time relating to, to that today. I don't think it's a gift that is for today. I think it was an apostolic gift. But whatever that gift looked like, you could have it. And if it was without love, it would sound like a clanging symbol, something that isn't pleasing to the ear at all. Um, you could wield a prophetic gift of utterance and, and give all of this information, have all of this knowledge, and, and understand mysteries that had long been concealed, but without love, that too would be meaningless. It would be meaningless to the people around you. You could exercise mountain-moving faith as well. And then without love, it would do nothing. You could take all of your material wealth, Paul says, and you could get rid of all of it in exchange for food that you could then give to people who were poor and hungry. And if you did that and it was without love, then that too would be vain and meaningless. All of these activities then are useless without love. Love is what gives religious activity power. That's what Paul is saying there. And so in order for religion to work, it needs to be filled with love. Love is essential. Now the second major movement, that's our topic this morning, that's the character of love. What we mean by the character of love is we're going to take a stab at defining it as the Bible defines it here. And uh, we see it very clearly here in verses 4 through 7. Love suffers long and is kind. And so we, we start off the passage and we say, okay, here's, here's a defining element of love. It's active, right? Because it is long and kind. What, what does the Bible mean when it says that love is long? What does the Bible mean? It means that it is patient, that it is long-suffering, right? Not short-fused, but love is long-suffering and very patient. And then Paul characterizes love by what it is not. He tells us with this pairing, love is long and love is kind, what it is. But then he launches into descriptive, descriptive phrases about what love isn't. And when he launches into those phrases, who is he describing? Well, in the near context, he's describing the Corinthian believers. They are everything that love is not. And it's possible that when you look at conduct, in the church or in Heritage Baptist Church even, you might see religious activity without a semblance of love. And so that's the idea that Paul is driving home here. Now, what does he mean here? I, I think he means that love is definitely something, right? It's true. It's something that we can really grasp, but it's not what everybody thinks it is, mm -hmm. right? And so... What's the mantra today when we're defining love? Love is love. Okay, well, what, what do people mean when they say that? Well, we know what they mean, right? It, it's used uh, in large part by people who want to be accepted as they are. That's love to them. Okay, well, that, that's not love according to the scripture. right? Love is not just acceptance or agreeableness. Sometimes love stands up and says, that's wrong, it's damaging, it's going to tear apart families and society, and it's going to lead to meaninglessness in your own life. Okay, that's love. But people don't like that definition. They want a definition that tolerates everything except for people who challenge them. You say, how could it get to this point? So you might, you might want to help there. Say, how could it get to this point? Uh, if they need the ministry, I was just thinking. I think that it gets to this point because of the uh, philosophy. The ideal, ideals of this world are built around something that is rooted in postmodernism that has gone way back into the 20th century. 
and it's been at work in our society for a long, long time, right? So we see postmodernism and, and its ugly fruit today where truth is relative and it's according to one's own narrative. Truth is not the truth, it's a version of the truth. And that version of the truth is a version that has to be accepting, that has to tolerate, tolerate sin, accept things that are ungodly. And that's the problem that we're running into today. Paul tells us that love rejoices in the truth. So there is this concept of true love. It's definitive. It's something that we can grasp. It's not in the abstract. And so Paul then concludes with four very strong statements in verse 7. He says that love bears all things, believes all things, hopes all things, and endures all things. What he's saying there is, you notice the pairing? He's taking the first and the last. And those are roughly parallel. Love bears all things. And love endures all things. In the present wicked age that we live in, how does it do that? By believing and hoping. That's the future. By believing and hoping in what cannot be seen and what will be. That that's that's what we that's that's what we have. That's the foundation that we have in order to keep on loving people who are not loving at all, even though they think they may be. That's the idea. So what love isn't, it, it, it's this characterization here that he's going through that begins with the forbearance and the kindness because that's the way that God is oriented toward us, right? So when he says love is long and kind, he starts with what it is and then he launches into what it isn't. Mm -hmm. but, but when he says that it is long and it is kind, he is really putting in our minds this idea of God's orientation toward us. When God looks at us, he is long-suffering and kind. God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. God did not love us when we were lovable. He loved us when we were enemies, when we were resisting him, when we were in rebellion against our creator as his creation. And so those loving attributes that God has toward us, that orientation of godliness toward us in love, is the same orientation that we should have to the people around us. But I'm afraid that in churches today, cynicism and a genuine disdain for what's happening in the world has caused Christians to see people as the problem and not Look to the Lord for the solution. We've lost hope in the power of God to change the lives of the people around us. That's precisely the problem. And so he then tells us love does not envy after laying that foundation. The Corinthians were envious people. They had created these factions and they lined up under these certain personalities and they have said, you know, we're of Paul, we're of Cephas, we're of Apollos. They were creating factions in the church because of envy. And that envy led to strife. Why? Because they were all trying to advance their particular faction and they were not advancing the cause of Christ. You know what people have said to me over and over again uh, because of the polarization that's happening in our world today? They have said the problem with our nation right now is that we are divided against itself. And a house divided against itself cannot stand. Well, that, that is exactly the case. A house divided against itself cannot stand. But remember, we have to be unified around the right things. We can't be unified around factions like liberalism and conservatism or, or political factions. We have, to be, we have to be unified around Christ and around true love. That's what we need to be unified around. And, and of course, the problem is people reject Christ. Once you reject Christ, you have no common ground. This is happening in our families, happening in our churches. People say that they love Christ, but they don't love Christ. They're not unified around the same thing maybe that you're unified around with other believers. Love does not envy. Love, love does not parade itself. We would simply say today that love does not behave in a boastful manner to parade yourself is to really vaunt yourself up like you're the banner, like you're the hero of the parade. 
And so boastful people, what are they constantly doing? They're bragging about their accomplishments. We're trained in our society to brag about who we are and what we've done and how great we are. And so we have people in our world today that want to be seen and they want to be heard and they, they have their YouTube channels and their Facebook pages and their Instagrams and all of these different things to parade themselves. They don't desire the gift that God has given them, the gift of love to serve other people, but they want to boast and to call attention to themselves. This is arrogance. Love is not puffed up. This is the end result of all of that pride, right? Puffed up. What did the Corinthians do in their puffed up way? <laughs> they, they, they set themselves up against the authority of an apostle. Someone that Christ sent into the world to lay down doctrine upon which the church would be built. They have the nerve to say, you know, we kind of like the wisdom of the world a little bit better. We're going after the philosophers of Corinth. And, and so we don't, we don't trust you anymore, Paul. And so all of a sudden, the Bible is not sufficient. We need critical race theory. Uh, we need to integrate um, psychiatry and psychology with what the Bible says. And so you have people that are integrating all kinds of worldly concepts of the Bible. And guess what message comes across? It's not the message of the Bible. It's a syncretism that is decaying. It has a decaying effect in the United States of America. It's puffed up people. Love does not behave rudely. I like what the King James Version says here. Love does not behave in a way that is unseemly. Doth not behave itself unseemly, right? That's what the King James says. So rudeness, the problem with rudeness is we tend to limit that word. I mean, there's no real problem with the word, but we limit it. We say, oh, they, he treated me rudely. He cut me off on the road or he was impolite. This, this word goes far deeper than that. We're not talking about this surface rudeness that occurs that sometimes teenage boys are involved in. We're talking about something that cuts to the quick, something that is shameful and, and disgraceful. And certainly the Corinthians were all about that. Look at the sexual immorality that was rampant in the church. And so love isn't that way. It, it, it isn't something that is rude in that sense. It's not disgraceful. They were that way. The, the, the Corinthian women were that way because they took upon themselves roles and responsibilities that God never intended for them to have. All of the Corinthians, men and women, were that way when they went to the Lord's Supper and, and the rich among them uh, shamed the poor among them. See, that's disgraceful. They were behaving in a way that did not honor Christ. They were not loving. You would say, well, they were having the Lord's table. They were not loving. See, that's the problem. Then he goes on to say, love does not seek its own. Certainly the Corinthians were, were self-seeking. <laughs> that's what they were all about, advancing their own cause. And we see that today, right? It's why they use their liberty as a stumbling block for other believers. That's what we're reading in chapters 8 through 10. They, oh, I can do that. I can eat, you know, this meat that had been offered to idols. I can sit in these uh, temples and not be affected by it. And, and uh, yet all of these weak believers were, were falling back into idolatry because of what they were doing. They didn't care. Who cares about that? You know, these are the same uh, people that would decry legalism today, right? You're legalistic. Right? I can do this. I can drink. I can I can smoke. I can chew. I can run with the girls that do too, right? <laughs> this is how our world is today. This is how Christians are in our world today. And so we're I don't know. What does the Bible say? Philippians 2, 4. I'm not looking out for my own interest, but for the interests of other people. You say, well, why does Paul say don't look out for your own interests? Aren't we supposed to be concerned about our own lives too? Well, Paul said, says, no, you're not supposed to be concerned about that because you already are concerned about that naturally. You already love yourself. Even people who contemplate suicide, well, they love themselves. They're so introspective that everything is eroding away on the inside of them. They're living life inward and not outward. And so the problem is rooted in their thinking, right? And so... That's a, a love that seeks its own. 
You love yourself? It's hard to live for other people. I get that. We just want to crawl up in our own hole, you know, and, and, and die sometimes. Or, or, or sometimes we, we have this mindset, well, I'm just going to, I'm going to pull into the garage. I'm going to close it even before I get out of the car. That way I won't meet anyone. And I'll walk right into my door and go through the laundry room and find my recliner. And there I am for the rest of the day. Especially now coming off of the pandemic, everybody's so accustomed to being at home. Nobody reaching out to the people that are around them and offering hope. We got to be careful about that mindset. It's self-seeking. You can only be happy in as much as you serve and sacrifice for other people. That's where you're going to find true satisfaction. You won't find it in living life for yourself. Because Jesus said, look, if you want to really be successful in your life, give your life away. That's where you'll find it. If you try to grasp onto your life and hold on to it, you'll hold on to it right up to your death, and you'll still be gripping it with those cold, dead hands in the, in the tomb or in the grave where you're headed. I mean, the scripture is replete with examples of that. And we, we have to be careful that we are not living for ourselves, but living for other people. And by the way, living just for your family, that's advantageous to you. All right? That's familyolatry. That's not the end of all things. It's living for others, period. It's living to love your neighbor. Who is your neighbor? Whoever is in your life at that particular juncture. You sacrifice and you serve for that person. Say, I don't deserve it. You didn't deserve it. I don't deserve it. That's not the point. We love because Christ loved. That's the idea. Love is not provoked. That, that provocation, uh, that word provocation there, in, in the King James, it's a good thing in Hebrews 10 and verse 24, because you can provoke believers unto love and, and to good works. That's good provocation. Provoke me along those lines all you want to. <laughs> Uh, but here, Paul is talking about not easily provoked in the sense that you're irritable, uh, irritated, maybe. That's the idea here. You're, you're provoked to anger and, and to wrath and to venting that wrath. Well, loving people are not irritated people, as the NLT says. That's true. We have to grab a hold of that concept and not so... I, I can tell if my mindset is loving, especially when I'm dealing with my sons. How irritated or how angry do I get when they do wrong? Where is that loving disposition? Where is that compassion then? See, that's the problem. Love thinks no evil. The New American Standard Bible has the phrase, does not take into account a wrong suffered. That, that's the heart of it right there. The, the heart of, of a wrong suffered there, thinking no evil in the sense of keeping this record of wrongs, keeping score in life. People are like that. You know, they, they might not do it in a note on their iPhone, right? I'm going to pull up my note for that person. Okay, they did this against me. I, I owe them one. I'm not talking about that. It's, it's something that is deep and, and it's spiritual and mental. And so people are constantly striking out at those who have done them wrong. There's no pity. There's no compassion. There's no love toward those people. You're just trying to be vindicated in your situation. So you are vindictive. I, I think about the Lord Jesus in this example, too, when he was on the cross. Did, did Jesus say on the cross, Father, count this great sin against these people. They deserve all the wrath that is coming to them. Is that what Jesus said on the cross? No, he said, Father, forgive these people. They don't know what they're doing. That's what Jesus said. And, and yet... We're Christ followers and we have this vindictive mindset. Where does that come from? Might it come from, uh, you know, media or from the, the way that we've lived our lives, most of our lives? We need to be different. We need to be steeped in the, in, in the love of Scripture. And so he tells us what love isn't. And then he comes from this idea of conviction, right? And it is convicting to hear all of those things, to the counterbalance of love. And we see it right here. Love does not rejoice in iniquity, but rejoices in the truth. So he gives us the negative again. We expect that. What love isn't. But then he tells us again what, what it is. It is something that does something. What does it do? It rejoices. 
where does it rejoice? It rejoices in the sphere of truth. Now, I want us to think about that because I think that that's a central concept of, of this passage today. All right, so love is something that rejoices in the truth. Not a version of the truth or some other narrative, but it is the truth, the definitive truth as revealed by the word of God. Jesus said, I am a truth. No, Jesus said, I am the truth. He is the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through him. So he, personif he personifies truth in that passage in John 14 and verse 6. And so when we look at this passage here, we rejoice in the truth because we rejoice in Christ and what he has done for us. To rejoice in iniquity, in iniquity, we see that all around us. We see it in the media. We see it in the way we talk about other people. This is the root of gossip, right? The, the root of gossip is not necessarily that it is, it is true or false. We're painting our own version of reality even with truthful things. That's not truth, right? That's trying to make people seem really, really bad. Often people want my opinions about certain people. I'm always hesitant to give them my opinions. I don't want to paint a picture that is wrong, uh, that will send people in their thoughts in a direction that, that, that they shouldn't go. Because that's not loving. That would be rejoicing in iniquity, not rejoicing in the truth. I, I think we are not very loving when we're glad that somebody gets what they deserve. Right? That, that's the iniquity that I'm talking about here. And that's the iniquity that Paul's talking about. And I think a lot of people love it when people get what they deserve. What we want, what, what we ought to want, what we ought to desire is mercy and truth for all. Justice for all. Mercy for all. I mean, talk about patriotism. That's the kind of patriotism we need running rampant in our country. We want mercy and justice for all. For all people. I, we certainly wanted it for ourselves. That's the reality of our orientation. Connected to the idea of truth is this idea of reality. What is real? As opposed to all of the false decaying philosophies and things that we see around us, what is real? What should our orientation be? And I would argue that it ought to be an orientation toward the truth. It ought to be an orientation toward the definitive truth, an orientation toward the truth revealed more specifically in the person and work of the Lord Jesus Christ. That's the counterbalance of love. Now that leads us to the constancy of love in verse 7. Verse 7 is this interesting conclusion to our paragraph this morning in the characterization of love. Love presently, right now, bears all things and endures all things because it's always got an eye on the future, believing all things, hoping all things. If we are always believing and always hoping, it is true we will assume the best about the people around us, but when we see things as they really are, that's the crux of this passage here. We see things as they truly are, and that gears our endurance, that gears our um, our, our ability to stay under the pressures of life in, in a way that, that bears with the people around us. That's why we don't have the short fuse. We are, we, we are a people who are long-suffering and kind, going back to the first statement that Paul gave us here. So this is just an amazing passage. It, it really helps us to understand that if we trust in God, then we will be able to bear with anything or endure whatever comes our way. That's what Paul is saying here. I think you could capture the heart of this entire paragraph, verses 4 through 7, if you would just take the noun for love out of the passage and put your name there. You talk about the convicting thought of love. Let, let's look at that. Here's a Here's the passage kind of in my own words or rephrased in my own words. And then I've got some blanks. I read through this with my name in it. Very convicting. What about you? Jim is patient and kind. Jim does not envy. Jim does not parade himself. He's not arrogant and puffed up. 
Jim is not shameful or, or disgraceful. He is not self-seeking or easily irritated by people. Jim doesn't keep a record of wrongs against those who hurt him. He doesn't rejoice over the fall of another human being. Instead, he understands things as they really are. True love. He rejoices in the truth. He bears with all things and endures all things because he is always trusting in God and hopeful that all will be made right in God's time. How would you fare putting your own name in verses 4 through 7? I would assume that you would be convicted by more than a few of those items I was. Because none of us live up to the standard. It's almost like beating up on mothers on Mother's Day by using Proverbs 31. This ideal woman, right? None of us live up to these biblical ideals, but the point is, we can. We can live up to them if we will put our trust in God, if we will put our faith in Him and live each day, one day at a time, one step at a time, connected to the people that are around us. This passage is really powerful. So let, let me just offer these three concluding thoughts here, and then we'll be done this morning. First of all, biblical love is very different, but it can also be elusive and evident at the same time. And I'll tell you what I mean. First of all, biblical love is very different in that it's different from the world's version of love. I've already alluded to that because the world is saying today, love is love. Christians should be saying God is love. Therefore, we're gonna emulate him. <laughs> uh, not, not what the world is saying. So we understand biblical love the argument that I'm making here today, we understand biblical love only in as much as we conform to the image of Christ. If we conform to Christ, then we understand love, and then we can love. That, that goes back to the two great commands. The two great commands are to love God supremely and to love others as you love yourself. You don't ever get commanded to love yourself because it's already assumed that you do. And so love others like you already love yourself. Guard and protect them just like you would guard and protect your own family. And that means sometimes as a pastor getting up and saying something really, really hard so that people will understand what love is all about. And that also means that many, many people will, will, will move away from you, even people within your own family, because they don't want to conform to the image of Christ. But we need to. In order to be effective as a church, we, not, we need a church that's filled with people that are serious about living for Christ. I don't want to be a pastor of a church that, that just, we show up on Sunday, we go through the motions, we're jovial, and we're happy, and all of those things, but then when we leave, we go back to who we were. That's, that's disintegration. There's no integrity in that at all. It's not real why our children uh, leave the Christian faith sometimes. They don't see the reality of Christianity in the home. They don't see love. That's what it comes down to. And so uh, we can't love as the world loves. We have to love as God has commanded us to love. And so expressions of love in the world are just that. Love is love. But for us, God is love. And so we're going to reflect God and his love to the world that needs it. Secondly, biblical love is not as prevalent as we might think. See, well, how could it be both elusive and evident at the same time? Well, it's elusive as we think about the world around us. People can't grasp it. But it's evident to Christians because God has revealed it in his word. So when I say it's elusive, I'm saying it's elusive in the world. When I'm saying it's evident, it's evident in the word. Elusive in the world, evident in the word. And we have the word of God. So we can understand what God has revealed to us. We can understand what love is. We don't have to say inane things like love is love. We can say God is love. I'll tell you what God is like. And I'll live the way that Jesus would live if he were here today. I won't do it perfectly, but you call me on it when I don't. See, that's the idea. That's the way that we ought to be living. We conclude that pride, envy, self-seeking, and self-indulgence, all of those things that I just mentioned to you, that characterizes the world. 
But, but God warns us against acting that way. Love is an action, right? It's a verb. And so I want to make sure that it characterizes my life in the way that God defines it. When I say to you, I love the United States of America, I love this country, I'm not saying to you, I love the state that we're in. I mean, I don't think any Christian in the right mind would say that, right? We, we don't love the polarization that's taking place. We don't love the wacky things that are happening, the way that they uh, are, are training the minds of our young people in our public educational institutions. We don't love that, right? None of us do. It's why we have a private school. Okay? We wouldn't need a private school if we were one nation under God, truly. But we're not. You say, does that, that mean we ought to give up on this idea of patriotism or the idea of the United States of America altogether? The answer is no. I love what our country once was and what our country can be again. And that's not futile optimism. That, that is a belief in the power of God to transform society and to bring in re revival. And so the only revolution that needs to be taking place is the revolution right within your own heart. You need to be transformed into the likeness of Christ. And that's going to happen when you're renewed in the word of God daily. And you're vulnerable in your relationships with one another. And then finally, biblical love is evident because it's evident in God's revelation. If God did not reveal it to us, we would not know it. But he has revealed it to us, not just in 1 Corinthians 13. I mean, this isn't, I mean, the whole New Testament is about love. I think that love is the governing characteristic of God. Right? Many people would, would say that it's holiness, but 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 even in with the idea of holiness, it is tempered by love. All right? Yeah, be holy because God is holy. But, but, but not in a cold and in a callous way. Not in a, a religious conformity um, that is empty and, and bland and, and, and heedless, but something that is ignited by the Holy Spirit through the Word of God. The, the Word of God is not just amassing all of these facts, but it's taking the facts and tamping them down into your soul like firewood and asking the Holy Spirit to ignite it. And when that happens, when people are on fire for God, then we'll see revival. And, and it can happen, you know, I, I, sometimes we all get fatalistic from time to time. We, you got to have that mindset. Yeah, I know that people may not be doing what is right, but I'm going to take care of myself. I'm going to, I'm going to exemplify characteristics that Christ exemplified for us. And I'm going to do that by God's grace every day. And I'm going to do it week after week and month after month. And I'm going to string some years together. And then I'm going to put this life together that has always pointed people toward Christ. That should be our goal. That should be the goal of every Christian in here. Yeah, be holy. God is holy. But never forget what Galatians 2 and verse 20 says. We live by faith in the Son of God who loved us and gave himself for us. And so we should love and give our lives to the people around us as well. Let's pray. Father, thank you for the opportunity to be here today. Thank you for this passage of scripture. It is so convicting. We know that we fail in many of these um, points, but we pray, Lord, that you would help us, even though we may not be sinless, to sin less and less in the days ahead and to put on Christ as we take off the world and its concepts. Help us, Lord, not to think in terms of the way the news anchormen tell us to, but to think in terms of the way that you've revealed it to us. Lord, may it not be the news that we turn on first in the morning, but we pray that it be our Bibles that we open up in our apps or physically in the morning. That we look to you for the greatest need that we have, and that is to love well. We pray it for Jesus' sake. All right, let's go ahead and sing together in closing, I Need Thee Every Hour. Five hundred and six. Let's stand and sing this together. <laughs> 